Uh, this is not Hans Meter. My name may be appearing as Hans Meter, but I am Kathy Schick. And I'm logged on as Hans because he is the pass holder, the password holder for this account. So I apologize. I'm unable to change my identity because I'm on a Mac. And I will also just say I'm fairly new to using a Mac. And two days ago, I cut a webinar off by accident. So I'm just going to say right now, if I cut you off, would you please just dial back in? I don't think it will happen, but let's just keep that as our, as our plan B. So good morning. You are muted right now, and that is so we don't hear your background noise, but we will unmute you uh, as we need to as we go through the presentation. Would you just take a moment to type in uh, just a hello and your name, and this, this is the most important part, if there's anyone else with you, we want that person to get credit for attending as well. So please just type in, uh, you know, hello, I am so-and-so, and, -so. and um, if you are having any technical issues, you can type those in as well. Welcome to the first webinar in this PLC program. We entitled this Start Strong, Stay Strong. And we know that you got off to a Start Strong this year. We're, we're sure you did. And now we're just going to go through some things that uh, will hopefully help you stay strong. And I thought I'd start with this little cartoon because I think we've all been there, haven't we? That fear of what's going on in that room. You're going to hear some voices today, and um, I'd like you to know who's in the room. So first of all, Jennifer Grams is with me. She is the co-facilitator uh, of this program and brings a lot of experience with this PLC program. So Jennifer, do you want to say hello? Sure. Thanks, Kathy. Good morning, everyone. We're happy to have you with us today. Thanks, Jennifer. And Jennifer is going to take the tough job today. She's going to uh, screen your questions and um, any technical glitches. I'm Kathy Schick, as I mentioned. Molly Shapiro um, is not with us today, but the three of us represent Meter Consulting Group, and Meter Consulting Group is the uh, consulting firm that is working with the Bureau of Career and Technical Education on this, on this project. And our special guest today, uh, the, the person you will really be hearing mostly, uh, is Tracy Stetler from Ready Muhlenberg, and Tracy will be um, more formally introduced in just a moment. Um, just want to do a quick, can you hear me now, tech check. I assume you can hear me. If you cannot hear me but you're seeing this screen, I'm hoping you are going to type something into the question box. I see some people have said hello. Thanks for checking in with us. A brief overview of today's webinar. Uh, the first thing we need to do is a little bit of work for Dr. Lee Burkett. You'll, you know that Dr. Burkett is the Director of Career and Technical Education in Pennsylvania, and she has a favor. And we're also then going to get into the heart of our discussion, classroom environment and management. And based on the feedback we received from you at Penn State uh, last month, we're, Tracy's really going to focus on routines that you can implement, procedures and routines that you can implement, and she does a really nice job of tying those routines into academics. Um, but we heard you, your feedback was that um, that's something you'd like to hear more about is, you know, maybe, some, maybe you'll pick up a new idea for a, a routine to implement or it will just reinforce something you're already doing. We do want to hear from you, so please you, the way that you can share is there is a little icon with a hand. If you click on that icon, you will be raising your hand virtually, and then we will pause and call on you. You can also type your question in, and as we go along, I will gently interrupt Tracy and let her know that there is a question. And then we will unmute you so you can ask that yourself if you'd like, or you can just type it in. And then I have a quick uh, follow-up and we'll do a little question and answer at the end. So that's the, um, the outlook for the next hour or so. So there's Dr. Burkett and she's looking right at you and she's saying, what type of sessions would you like to attend at the conference? So she's planning ahead for the June 2014 PACTEC conference 
and um, she would like to know from each of the groups very specifically what conference session would interest you in your program area. So is there a specific piece of equipment that you um, would like to see the manufacturer come? Or is there a textbook or a publisher that you'd like to have an opportunity to talk with? So please type in, Jennifer will be capturing your suggestions and this is a direct, uh, we will take these directly to Dr. Burkett. So this is your opportunity to have the ear of Dr. Burkett for um, what you'd like to see. And I'd also like you to type something in for my own um, interest. We, ha we, we are calling you the electrical PLC, but um, we've noticed there's some different acronyms for your program. Um, I know I'm from LCTI and we have a few different programs. Would you just type in what your program is called in your school? I would just like to see so we have a better range of, um, of that information. Okay, and so far I'm not seeing any feedback for Dr. Burkett, so please let us know even if you, even if you know you're not going to um, attend that conference. What do you think people in your, your colleagues are, what's, what's going on in your field right now? And I'm going to say in electrical technology from Gary, or electrical occupations, or electrical and power. Uh, boy, we have a lot of different residential and industrial. I have to open that one up to see the whole thing, Dave. Um, so we've got a lot, of, a lot of different ways that your program is identified. But we need to see what you'd like to see at the conference. Okay, we're going to get started. Um, I just wanted to share a quick picture to get us sort of in the mood. These are some pictures that were sent to me. They're not, they're not very bright, and I apologize for that. But at LCTI, there are several teachers that use the uh, routine of last five and five and first five and five, and these are posters that they make. Uh, this is what the kids are expected to do, the first five things in the first five minutes of class, or the last five things in the last five minutes of class. And these are routines that are um, taught, practiced, and more importantly, you know, reinforced. Otherwise, they, they just become a poster collecting dust on the wall. And then the last photograph is, uh, just as many of you do, um, having that uh, agenda right the first thing kids see when they walk in the door every day so that you have a routine established of they know where to look and know what to do. I'm going to introduce Tracy now. Um, we're so glad to have Tracy with us and we've so far, you are our third of six webinars and Tracy is just really um, getting great feedback from the teachers in the first two webinars. And I think that's mostly because Tracy has a lot of experience as a a career in tech instructor. Tracy actually started her career as a culinary arts instructional assistant at Berks, and uh, then she moved to baking and pastry arts instructor for 12 years at Reading Muhlenberg, and which is um, she's also a graduate of that program. And then she transitioned in 2011 uh, at Reading Muhlenberg. She transitioned into their literacy integration specialist. So she's doing literacy coaching, and she spends the majority of her time helping program instructors like you incorporate uh, various aspects of literacy into their theory lessons and their performance criteria. She models strategies. She uses technology to enhance program content and to develop new ideas uh, for embedding literacy. Tracy's currently working on helping program instructors analyze NOPTI data, and she's very interested and does a lot of work with helping teachers to evaluate and improve their classroom management. She facilitates learning walks, for example, to help teachers learn and share best practices. So Tracy, we welcome you. Thank you so much, and I will, if you don't mind, be the rude uh, host who interrupts you as, um, as questions and comments uh, pop up. So take it away, Tracy. Thank you. And I'm going to quickly just sh change screens here so that Tracy can show her screen. 
Oh, I'm just so hoping I don't cut off the webinar at this point. <laughs> that was a bad moment for me, everyone. Tracy, did you get the did you get the invitation to share screens? Yep, it's there. Uh, I see it. Do you? I uh, I have to get out of my own now. I do. So we're good to go. So I, uh, Jennifer, do you see Tracy's screen? I sure do. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Tracy. All right. Great. Okay, well, as Kathy said, thank you for that introduction. My name is Tracy Stetler, and uh, I'm from Reading, Muhlenberg. And uh, I'm going to share some um, classroom management. Welcome to GoToWebinar, webinars made easy. Was expressed an interest in when you were at Penn State for the initial PLC welcome. And those three areas are routines and procedures, uh, engaging learning environment, and positive relationship. And again, please uh, submit your questions as we go so that I don't get too far ahead and we get away from, you know, the topic of your question. I'd rather have them coming, you know, as we're going. So um, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to go to routines and procedures first, and I'm going to do a little bit of an overview. And then um, I'm going to show some examples of what I cover in this first screen. So there will be examples coming for pretty much everything that I talk about um, on each of the um, topic screens. So the first thing I want to cover is routines and procedures. And uh, a big part of routines and procedures is being prepared and organized. Uh, what are you going to do and what the students will do uh, when you are completed with your theory lesson or for that day? Um, so deciding what you're going to do and being prepared and organized for that, whether that means having something ready on the um, whiteboard screen or uh, materials are ready to go. You have uh, uh, some kind of video queued up and minimized. So everything is smooth running and the students have very, very, very little downtime because we all know what happens when students have too much downtime. Um, the other thing that we do here at Reading Muhlenberg is that we incorporate reading, writing, and math every day in every theory lesson. So. In the AM, we have level twos and level ones. And in the PM, we have level ones and level three. So that means we're teaching four theory lessons per day at least. Now, there could be more depending on a student's different student schedules and when they go to lunch, when they have social studies, and things like that. So you know, there's a lot of you know, things with the schedule that can get in the way of this. But um, for the most part, we do some sort of literacy and numeracy every single day in every lesson. Now that can be in the um, you know, confines of a theory room or it can be out in you know, the lab area. Clear expectations. What are your expectations? What will your students expect from you? Um, a big part of this is we use a classmate grading system at our school and uh, contract grading fits in with this. What is the student going to do? for this particular time period, and how are you going to assess them, and uh, you know, what, what are they going to be required to finish within this period of time, or what are they going to be working on during this period of time. Students like to know those things. They like to know what to expect. You know, they don't like surprises most, for the most part, and uh, you know, this gives them a good timeline you know, and a, an idea of what they are going to be covering in that particular quarter or whatever. Um, gaining their attention. A, routine, a good routine to get into is finding something every day that gains their attention. Now you can, you can go with the same thing every day. Uh, you know, I think changing it up sometimes helps. It helps you know, kind of with that uh, monotonous thing that we tend to fall into. We get comfortable with doing something. Try something new. Uh, if you do a word of the day or you put a word up on the board when the students come in that's your program area related, and it sparks some sort of um, journal writing activity, try a video the next day, or try some sort of different writing prompt, or try a picture, or a quote. We have a, a, an instructor here that ever since he started, uh, he has put a quote in his room. He has a little easel where he has a quote up every day for the AM and PM. And he has his students journal about 
the particular quote and the person who wrote the quote or said the quote. So, um, you know, if it's Martin Luther King Jr. and there's a quote there by that person, then they would write about that and possibly talk about Martin Luther King Jr. So, uh, you know, not only are they getting a quote that they can write about and maybe find a relationship with, they're also learning about a new person as well. So, you know, there's two ways that the quote can be used like that. Um, a picture is good, and I'll show you an example of some of those, a writing prompt, a math problem. You know, putting up a math problem is great because uh, there are students in your class who, you know, are really good at math, and then there are students that are going to be struggling with math, and there are ways that um, you can help them with that, and I'll talk about that in a second as well. And then developing some habits for the students to um, you know, follow every day, getting into that daily routine, whether it be changing into the, a uniform, a t-shirt that has their logo on it. Um, there's a few program areas in our school that have their own t-shirt that they put on every day, and that is their part of their uniform. The students designed the t-shirt, and so they're proud to wear it. They've designed it as a, as a class and voted on you know, a design or whatever. And uh, this is part of their routine. They change into their shirt, you know, or their, their work boots. They have their safety glasses, and they have their tool tags, and they sit down, and they, you know, are not permitted to work in the shop unless they have all those things in place. So that daily routine really helps. It gets them right to their lockers, going, doing what they're supposed to be doing right off the bat, sitting down, getting their journal, whatever it may be that you have has established their routine. But students like this. There's no downtime. They know exactly what they need to be doing. This also builds independence and, and responsibility. They have a responsibility. They're not going to be able to work, and they're not going to get paid, per se, by a grade unless they do this. And um, I have some examples of that as well. Uh, this is um, from one of our health occupations classrooms, and it is her daily reflection. And this can be set up in a bunch of different ways, but Basically what it is is it's a way for students to reflect on what they've done that day, learn new vocabulary, write a little bit about their, you know, their, their day, write a definition about the vocabulary, complete a math problem of the day. But not only with, with this one, she also has incorporated at the top, you see Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, then you'll see underneath Monday it says trace, underneath Tuesday it says explain, Wednesday analyze. These are all examples of the 12 powerful words. And we introduced these to our staff a few years ago um, as part of a little bit of an in-service activity. But uh, if you Google 12 powerful words, you'll get you know thousands of hits on it. And you'll find websites that have this. But our uh, teachers have posters in their rooms. And basically, what the 12 powerful words are, these are words that students will see on standardized tests, every standardized test. So um, they will be asked to explain something, analyze something, summarize something. So it's a good way to get students familiar with these words. They're going to be seeing them, guaranteed. Um, my son's 11, and a few years ago when he took the PSSAs uh, in his class, I think third or fourth grade, whatever it was, he actually came home with the 12 powerful words, and you know they were teaching them that way back, you know, even in grade school. So. It should be something your students are familiar with, and if they're not, get them familiar with them. So again, it's 12 powerful words. Um, so this particular teacher has the students using these to tell about their day. So analyze, break apart what you learned today, summarize, sum up what you learned today. So that's what the lines are for. And then at the end on a Friday, she has a free write, write a paragraph about what you learned. And then she has vocabulary, and this can be SAT vocabulary, this can be word of the day in general, this can be a program area word of the day, it could be a tool, um, and then a definition. And then she has a spot for a math problem that she puts up on her board every day. So the students would copy that math problem and um, complete the math problem on the paper. The other way I've seen this done, and I'll show you another example next, uh, um, is doing this as a time card. The students write down what they do every day. And uh, I used a time card kind of system in baking because you know I had 30 students in the AM, 30 in the PM, and uh, keeping track of what all those students were doing any given day, any given hour, was a lot. So the students are responsible for telling me what they did, what they worked on, uh, what tasks they were performing, uh, you know, as 
part of their grade. And it helped me because I was able to you know, reflect that in the classmate grading system. And they had to write what they did. And if they forgot and they didn't write something down, well, they didn't get credit for it. So it's responsibility. And if they didn't fill out their time card, they essentially didn't get paid or a grade. So that's another way that this can be done. This is another example. This is actually from Autobody. And uh, he has this as a page of the day. It's every day is a sheet. So the name and then auto body word of the day and defining that. And at the, at the bottom, SAT word of the day and defined. And then he has a math problem. And these are built into each of his sheets. And it's a word problem. And they're always, always related to the program area. This is important because you know, they're, not only are they going to be seeing these types of math problems on the Nazi, but you know, these are real world math problems. So in this case, it says calculating his weekly expenses. Um, Mentors, I think, auto body found. He had spent the following amounts on parts, you know, overall expenses, labor, gasoline. So these are examples of real world problems that the students will encounter when they're out in the industry. So you know, this is important to have them be related to your program area. And then in the middle, in the blank box, is where the students would write down and reflect about their day. What they did, what tools they used, you know, what project they were working on, and so on, so that um, the instructor can keep track of these things and you know, possibly have some feedback in there and give them their grade. This is an example of a booklet that we use uh, here at Reading Nuremberg. And a, a, new, a number of teachers are using this booklet style format. Um, Chad Hefner, the electrical uh, instructor here, is using this. And uh, it is a booklet that would be worth 100 points toward the weekly grade. And this is per week, so it's one booklet per week, uh, although his are tied to his textbook chapters. And um, he could have six booklets for one chapter, depending on how long the chapter is or how involved that chapter becomes. And the students would complete this, and this would be part of their um, grade in Classmate. And then at the bottom, he has quotes as well. So um, you know, again, to get students thinking about you know writing and, and reflecting on something that someone said. This is an example of the inside of the book. This would be this is day four assignment, but uh, it would be day one, two, three, four, five. And the reason we have it in days is because sometimes a book is started in the middle of the week. Sometimes we're out, you know, we're off Monday and Tuesday, so we're starting a booklet on a Wednesday. And we just changed it because the days of the week just weren't meshing with what we needed. And basically, this is something that can be customized however you would like it to be. So in this case, he's using an electrical word of the day, knockout plug, and then define, write a sentence. And then he has a math problem at the bottom. Now, his math problem is usually put on the smart board in the morning, so it wouldn't be embedded into the packet, although it could be. His are done, um, there would be a blank spot under the math problem of the day, and his students would transfer it to the paper and uh, answer that question from the smart board. And then on the right-hand side, there is a spot for a paragraph of the day. So list for materials, it must be listed, you know, and give the code. So he uses the code book a lot because that is part of a NOCTI task. The students must you know, be able to use the code book in, on their NOCTI exam. So this is embedded a lot in his books, um, his packets that he uses. And there's a spot there for the student to write their paragraph. And then there's a rubric that's in this book as well, or it can be posted in your classroom. And uh, the rubric states you know, what's expected of the five sentences, minimum five sentences, indenting the paragraph, you know, the proper terminology is being used, and things like that. So that is checked on a daily basis. You can see the uh, word of the day is worth five points, the math problem is worth five, and uh, the actual paragraph is worth 10, which gives him the 20 points for the day. Um, and then, like I said, five days a week, it becomes 100 points. Now, um, you know, this can very quickly, if the students do not complete this, can very quickly affect their grade. So it's a, again, it's a routine that the students can follow. It's done every uh, day with each level. So he has different levels of students, have different uh, packets, and that's how this is kind of done. 
if anybody would like one of these packets or one of these packets to be shared, I can certainly send the template. Um, you know, again, it can be customized however you want it to be. And the, the great thing about this packet is that it's always tied to the theory lesson for that day. So that day, Chad is going to talk about knockout plugs. He's going to talk about, you know, the writing assignment on the right-hand side so that the students are prepared to write about it. They can also refer to their textbook. Um, for the math problem of the day, there could be a student that's assigned to uh, teach that math lesson for the day, uh, which gets the students involved. And it also helps you know, create that kind of sense of responsibility for that student uh, every day. I'm going to ask Tracy, if you don't mind, before we go on, um, just asking if there are any questions to please uh, type those in. But I'm going to briefly, just to um, give you an opportunity to tell us a little bit about what you're doing, I'm going to briefly put a, a poll on your screen. So if you would please um, respond to this quick poll. I currently use a word of the day or other vocabulary building routine each day. And uh, let's see what we have here, because we'd love to hear for those of you that are doing this, we'd love to hear what maybe your routine looks like. We have 73% of our people have voted. And boy, are we a, a mixed group. 50% of you said, yes, you do. 50% said, no, you don't. And we have 100% voted, and we ended up with 55% of you said you do have some daily routine for vocabulary building. And um, please, please feel free to jump into that question box and type uh, what it is you're doing for your routine of building vocabulary. And we thank uh, Chad and Tracy for sharing theirs. OK, and I know you have more, Tracy, so we'll go right back to you. Let me get the poll closed. OK. OK. Um, this is an example of a word of the day. These are posted on our TV screens. Each uh, There's a TV in every program area and in the hallways. Um, and uh, I provide these to um, the staff. If the instructors would like them emailed to them, some like them emailed to them, and so they can post them you know, up on their screen, or they can print them out and line them up on their board, whatever they want to do with them. Some make magnets with them or whatever. So um, you know, this is up every day. It's a different word. And uh, students can use this as part of their journal activity. Teachers can incorporate them into their you know, daily sheets. Um, well, what I wanted to talk about real quick, and I forgot when we were talking about the, um, the reflection sheets, is that you know, some instructors here also embed their words of the day into their sheets. They also do embed their math problems into the sheets, and everything is related to you know, their you know, uh, lesson for that day. So those things can be embedded into those sheets. They don't have to be just left blank for the students to write them in. They can be typed in by you and given to the students that way as well. So this word of the day, and I can, or you can, the teachers sometimes do, or I do, create uh, games for, you know, let's say two weeks worth of words of the day, and um, create smart board games or things like that so that they reinforce those words. And that can be done for program area words as well to reinforce. This is an example of something we do at our school called Math Mania. We have a math coach who is wonderful, and uh, she does this weekly. And it's always um, you know, kind of theme related. This one happens to be pumpkin, because it was a couple weeks ago when it was Halloween. And she always you know, tries to do it as part of the RMCTC family kind of thing. So here she says students in RMCTC have shopped for items to decorate pumpkins. Sometimes it's related to you know the construction cluster and then she'll actually use students names their first names and have you know uh, Jose you know needed you know to uh, calculate you know square footage of a shed or whatever and uh, this that becomes her math mania and uh, this is done school-wide or it can be done individually by students some program areas participate in it together so the whole class would do this together possibly again uh, a good uh, opportunity for a student to teach 
teach a math lesson or maybe teach another way of finding out the answer. I know when I was in baking, I would teach the students the way I learned, you know, baking math. And we'd talk about, you know, the word problems that would be on the Nazi and uh, how to solve those problems. And sometimes a student would say, uh, you know, I have another way of solving that problem. And I'd bring them up and say, you show me and show the class. And some students thought that way was easier, and some students thought the way I taught them was easier. So either way, we got the point across. We got them to learn the math concept, no matter which way it was that uh, they could, you know, learn it easy, you know, the easiest way for them. So I was always glad for that. So, um, you know, this is an example of math mania. So that's how you could incorporate math into your program area as well as, you know, your program-related math. This is something else that you could do as part of a routine. It could be a tool of the week. Um, what is it? So this can be up on the board as kind of a prompt for students to write about. What is it used for? So maybe one day you could have the tool of the week and put this up on a Monday and then just write the question, what is it? And the students would sit and write in their journal what they predict this tool is. And uh, then the next day maybe what it is what, what is it used for? And then the third day, what are the safety precautions? And then the fourth day, maybe how they used it. You know, when the teacher maybe started talking about it and had the students actually perform some skills with it, uh, you know, they could write about that. So it's just another way of, um, you know, for having a routine and introducing a new tool. I know there are some program areas that really, especially some of the new instructors um, in the building this year, they you know, feel like their students don't know enough about the tools. And they're surprised that they don't know more about the tools that are in their program area. So this is good review for the, even those students who have been there. And also, maybe tools they'd be using for the NACTI. This, is, uh, this screen shows some examples of uh, some, some photos or pictures you could use to uh, create or have students talk about or write about as a you know a prompt for when they come in. So you could have this comic up here on the top left that says just put those safety awards on the table, and you know you see this wire running across. So obviously she's not being really safe, but she's winning awards. So it's just a funny kind of cartoon that the students maybe could reflect on. You know what? Why is it? What makes that you know so ironic there? Um, on the right, there is a diagram of what they would see if they'd have to read a blueprint. Um, there's, on the bottom right, we show a little safety issue there. I don't think that's something that should be, <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, Chad, but I don't think that's something that should be, you know, uh, done. But, you know, it's just something to spark students' interest, kind of uh, help them start the writing process. It's a good lead-in to a, uh, a theory lesson for that day, maybe on you know blueprint reading for you know electrical engineers or whatever. This is something that our school does, the Nazi Monday. Uh, we do it on a Monday because we have Nazi review on a Monday because that is the day that we have work-based learning check-in. So any student that's on co-op work-based learning would be coming in on a Monday to check in. So that means they're available in your class to do some NACTI review. Um, so these are two example questions uh, that um, Chad gave me from his NACTI. So this is probably questions that all of you should be familiar with. So you could cover these two questions. Students can have their own NACTI journals, or they can use their own journals uh, in any way, and have them write these problems down, uh, and have them solve them, and then have the discussion about them. And then uh, you could also add a spot where you know the students perform some sort of practice on a NACTI skill that they would have to do for the performance part of the um, exam. So that can be all part of your NACTI Monday for your um, you know, level three student. And uh, I know when I used to do this in baking, I would even have level one students in the PM write these questions down, or they would you know, attempt to answer the questions. I would just have them up when they came in, and they would look at them, and they'd try to answer the questions. And they thought this was fun to try to answer these questions. And then they got this kind of preview of what was going to be happening in a couple years with this NACTI. So, you know, it kind of really embeds it in their heads way early for those first-year students. 
and then here it is, list the tool and supplies you will need to complete the following NACI task. So that could be something you'd have up to do as a performance part. And Jenna, or, uh, Tracy, I'm going to jump in for a minute if that's okay. Sure. Uh, we had a, a comment from Kevin, and um, Kevin, we, going back to the, you know these daily routines with with vocabulary, um, he does a quote of the day. He puts it on the board, and this is what I love about um, the twist that he has that I think is a great takeaway. They discuss the quote, and the students choose the power word of the quote, and then that becomes the word of the day. I really like that, Kevin. Um, I'm a reading specialist by trade, and vocabulary is my passion. And I mean, it really is the key to unlock all of our literacy. And I love that for two reasons. I love that the students are picking it, and I love that it's uh, probably an academic word. Um, and that is what we're finding through research. Those academic words, we all as teachers do a great job of teaching our content words, our content specific, specific words. But when kids are taking standardized tests, it's the academic words that are tripping them up, the words like consequently, or you know, words that as adults we come across in our reading daily. And, and there's really not a lot of context clues for those type of words. So Kevin, I think that's a great idea. And I love that the kids are the ones picking it, picking the, the power word. Thanks for sharing. Thanks, Tracy. Okay. Yeah, that's a great idea. I'll definitely share that with the uh, instructor that's doing the quotes of the day in his classroom. I'm sure he'd appreciate that. Yeah, I thank you that. for that. Okay, next area we're going to cover is engaging learning environment. And uh, a big thing about this part is the materials that you use and your lab setup. Um, the materials should be ready and available for students. So again, we're going back to, you know, into that routine where the materials are set up and ready, whether it be handouts for your students or, you know, pencils, whatever it is. And this isn't just for you, but students should have their materials ready and lined up and, and ready to go. Even if that means every day for, you know, a month, you have to put down a list of things up on the board that the students need to have every single day when they come and sit in your classroom. So if it's a pencil or a pen, or they have to have their safety glasses, or they have to have their toolkit, or whatever it is, you know, that they are responsible to have that. And if you have to put a reminder up for a month, two months, whatever it takes, that's what you'll have to do. You know, I know I did those kinds of things when I was in the classroom. You know, you think that they should know this by now, and you say to yourself, oh, you know, it's about time, they know this, but, you know, the reality is sometimes they just don't. And, you know, this is a helpful way to get them, you know, going in the morning and, and again, reduce that downtime. Um, so you should have your materials ready. If you're going to do a demo, make sure you have your stuff, you know, ready to go. Your, you know, if you're going to have a demo on a piece of equipment, have it ready. Um, your lab setup. This is an area where, um, especially new instructors, um, you know, they sometimes are disappointed in the way the lab is set up when they come in. They're not used to having it done this way. Uh, you know, visiting other schools and seeing how their labs are set up is a good way. The other way is to have your occupational advisory committee uh, on your OAC night come in and really take a look at your lab setup, see if they think it's, you know, set up business and industry style or if they think it's a, done in a way that's conducive to learning. So there isn't too many steps that the kids have to take or whatever, something that wastes time or your tool room. How's your tool room set up? You know, could it be set up in a, you know, more, um, you know, organized way or whatever? So, you know, get that input from business and industry people. You know, they, they know and uh, they can give you a lot of input about that. Part of creating an engaging learning environment is knowing how your students learn. Um, doing a VAK learning style assessment is one way. Um, this is visual, audio, and kinesthetic. So deciding or finding out how your students learn best and teaching to that learning style, which you'll probably be teaching to multiple learning styles every single day, but it isn't a bad idea to know your individual students' learning style so that you know things could be customized or you know, done in a different way so that uh, they can better understand and learn in, in their way. Uh, we use, and I'll give you an example when we get to the screen, but we use a computer um, program that will grade it 
uh, not grade it, but assess them, and uh, gives them exactly what their learning style is. It's a fun way to do it. The students really enjoy answering the questions and you know learning about how they learn. Some of them have no idea that there's actually you know a, an assessment that tells them the best way that they learn. And by answering these questions, you know, they, they can come up with that and they learn. And it, it becomes a good tool for reflection, a good tool to talk and, you know, converse with the students about. They talk to each other, hey, I'm this style, what are you? You know, all that kind of thing. So it's, it makes for a good engaging conversation um, with the students. Grouping students, um, seating arrangements, color coding. Grouping students, um, you know, is you know, kind of an art form sometimes in itself, learning who to put with who and changing those groups periodically, uh, giving students roles within those groups, you know, assigning timekeepers, assigning somebody to do the, you know, the writing of things, you know, writing things down, write the directions down for the group and then share it. And, you know, doing those kinds of things. And uh, it helps create a, um, a team environment. Everybody feels like they're part of a group. Everyone has a task within that group, not just one person doing everything in the group, because we know how that all can happen. So having every student be accountable in the group. Um, seating arrangement is also important. Uh, you can change your seating arrangement periodically. This uh, can be something that's a good, a change in a good way. Some, you know, like I said, students sometimes don't like change, and they may not like it at first. But sometimes they'll enjoy that, you know, when are you going to change the seats? You know, when, when are we going to have a different arrangement? So not only changing their physical location, but also changing the desk arrangements. You know, maybe creating pods instead of just rows or, you know, a circle instead of, a, you know, instead of just, you know, the traditional everyone's in a line looking at the back of everybody's heads. So, um, you know, that in itself can be helpful to, you know, create that engaging learning environment. Color coding. Um, I have a whole PowerPoint, uh, a whole presentation that I um, did with a, one of the health medical instructors on using color coding and how you can use color coding in your classroom and how it creates an engaging learning environment, how it helps students stay organized. And if you're interested in that, you can email me and I will send it to you. Um, but some examples of this could be just having the paper in a different color for every quarter. So they know and you know that the purple papers are to be handed in for first quarter and the, the green ones are for second quarter. And, you know, having a code for each thing. And that's something a lot of the health medical uh, prof you know, professionals do. They do a lot of color coding. I noticed it very heavily used in the health medical profession and those instructors. Um, another way it can be done is you know, maybe bins with supplies. So, you know, if you're the blue group, your group of students is the blue group or the pink group or the green group, everything in that group is color-coded for that group. So you get a very quick idea of who's completing what work when they hand it in because they're, everything is color-coded. The paper is color-coded. Maybe they have um, a bin that's blue, and they know they've got to go pick their bin up that has the supplies in it every day for what they need. Um, the new baking instructor does this um, a lot. She has a bin with color coded, and then even in her textbooks, she's covered them in, in uh, you know old paper bags, and then uses blue or pink or green duct tape, and just does the spine or does a, a design on the, the book, so they know that those are their books. So you know it's just things like that that create that learning environment that kids enjoy, you know, participating in. And Tracy, I'm going to ask you if we can just pause right there again, uh, just before we get too far away from this. Um, Mike, Mike had an, uh, an idea, and I'm going to ask, Mike, would you, I hope you don't mind, I'm going to unmute you, Mike uh, Whitner, and I'm just wondering, let's see if we can ask Mike. Hey, Mike. Hi, could you hear me? I can hear you. I think we all can. Um, you had an idea that I'm, I'm not sure I would do justice to it. So would you share your idea about your slang words? Because it sounds, my husband is a high school health teacher, and I'm already thinking, wow, what he could do with slang words. <laughs> but would you go ahead and, and, and share your idea with us, please? Sure. Uh, I put on the board once a week uh, three slang words. Uh, in the electrical field, we have lots of different terms for our material. 
and they have no clue what the words are. I just put them on the board. They free write a short story about anything they want using those three words in it. And then uh, after the assignment's completed, we tell them what they actually are, and we discuss the uses of the material or the tool that uh, the nickname was for. Great. And so when yeah, they the kids have, really enjoy it. And they can write about anything, right? Anything they want. I think that's a real key to incentive with reluctant writers. Uh, and I'm not suggesting your kids are reluctant, but we often, you know, let's face it, high school boys are often reluctant writers. And I think that's a, that's a great um, way to incentive, you know, get them to, to be motivated. And I bet you don't correct these for grammar and spelling and punctuation either, do you? Uh, the first marking period completed, the second marking period, then we start, you know, and then as the marking periods go on, uh, yeah. by the fourth marking period, that's when we actually, you know, we actually do grade for grammar, sentence structure. Great, so you, you ease in on that. Mm-hmm. Great. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Mike. And now I get to use my power that I want to have in all aspects of my life. I get to mute you. So I'm, okay. I'm very rude doing that, but I have to mute you again. So thanks for sharing, Mike. And one last thing. Um, let me go back to, I think it was, oh, who asked for something? Um, sorry, I'm looking through. Jennifer, someone asked for... Oh, uh, James, I, I, unless you go by Jim, uh, James Jessberger asked for a copy of the packet that Tracy mentioned earlier. And I do, this is a good moment for me to share that um, you will be receiving later today or tomorrow a follow-up to this webinar. And in it will be Tracy's PowerPoint. And um, Tracy, how, how do you feel about, should we just in, also attach one of the packets? Uh, I can do that. Uh, also, at the end of the PowerPoint is my email address, and people can email me as well. Then I have that connection, and if they need anything else, I can. Okay, give them let's do too. that. So, so um, James, we'll we'll send you in our email from Jennifer and me, Kathy. We will send you a follow-up email that will include Tracy's PowerPoint, and within that PowerPoint, you'll have contact information. Um, for Tracy, and that, that's a good idea, Tracy, that you can connect with him in case he'd like to talk to Chad or, or get, you know, make that connection, because this really is about networking, so let's, let's do that. Okay? How's everybody doing? Does anyone else have a question? You could raise your hand. Or how about this? Let me just say, how's everyone doing? Raise your hand if you're with us. Give you a chance to raise your hand. Oh, look at all those hands popping up. We've got a group of about 14 teachers with us. And uh, believe me, we realize that as teachers, we like to be the ones talking and walking and, uh, you know, moving around. So we know this is always a little, a little bit difficult for us to sit and, and be listeners. So please do get involved, share your questions, your comments. And uh, let's go back to Tracy. She's going to talk for about another 15 minutes, and then we'll wrap up. Thanks, Tracy. OK. So uh, next area is bulletin boards, word walls, wordles, other visuals for your classroom. Um, doing bulletin boards, you don't have to do these at the beginning of the school year. I see, you know, for years I, I see teachers coming in, doing their bulletin boards and things like that. This is something I firmly believe students should be involved in. Uh, I, I think they enjoy doing these things. There's definitely kids every year who always enjoy doing this. And, uh, you know, putting the bulletin boards together, giving you ideas for the bulletin boards. Um, you know, so this is a way for students to get involved in your classroom. Now, this could be, you know, again, word walls. The bulletin boards could have all kinds of visuals. The students can help you pick the visuals. Students can help you pick the words that are on the word wall. Um, wordles, I'm going to talk about that in a second. I think a lot of people already know what a wordle is, but it can be used in a, a lot of different ways. Other visuals, you know, maybe there's a way, you know, I know in, in sewing where there's a lot of, you know, different materials. They, they put materials on the, on the uh, bulletin boards and things like that. You know, there could be a blueprint in uh, electrical, things like that. Pictures of tools. Um, you know, and, and descriptions, and and the students would make these. 
So it, it gives them a sense of that, you know, this is my home. This is my learning environment. I'm going to participate in this home and learning environment by helping to decorate, per se, or make it the environment I'd like it to, to be. Student mentors, I, I think pretty much everyone, hopefully, uses student mentors in their class. Uh, having students that um, you know are particularly good at, at a skill, and this goes back to even the math problems, or having a student choose the words of the day, um, you know, and, and putting those up for a week at a time, whatever. Um, having a student help another student. I know in, in baking I used this when I had some English second language students. I had some students be translators for times when it was difficult for these students to understand certain concepts because of that language barrier. So I had student mentors that, that volunteered to do those things for me because I couldn't do them. I don't speak another language. So, you know, these are valuable you know, kids in your classroom that, you know, sometimes are underutilized. So find those students that can be that mentor and that can help that student, whether it's helping another student open a locker every day or giving out reminders that, um, you know, that, you know, tomorrow this is due, don't forget, or whatever. Um, so I think, I'm sure you can think of a lot of different ways you could use student mentors in your classroom, just a few examples. Student responsibility. I'm all about student responsibility and putting responsibility onto students. They're, you know, they're only going to be in school another couple years, and then that's it. You know, they're going to be responsible for their destiny and, and what's going to happen to them and how they're going to take the tools you've given them, the skills you've given them, and how they're going to run with it. So, you know, I'm all about giving students some responsibility. I'm, I'm about giving students uh, the opportunity for input as well. So, some ways of give, giving students responsibility would be to create shop for a person, um, having that student trained, training your students how to be a boss, essentially, or how to be um, you know, that, that person in a leadership role, and how to get students to you know, perform the tasks they need to perform without screaming at them at the top of their lungs or you know, kind of using their street logo and things like that, lingo for you know, getting the job done. So teaching those students how to be good leaders and how to multitask, how to teach other students how to multitask, how to teach others responsibility, you know, that's something that we used to do a lot in baking. We'd, we'd role play a way to you know, ask a student to get a job done or finish a task or put something away as opposed to the maybe not, not a great way to do it screaming or yelling or using profanity or something like that to get the job done. So, you know, teaching those students those professional skills that they'll possibly need to know in the future, we hope. Um, development of rules. This is where student input can be valuable. Ask the students, have a, have a whole day, maybe at the beginning of the school year or whatever, where you have the students input the development of your rules of your, in your classroom. So breaking them up into groups and saying, OK, you're, each group is going to come up with a list of rules that we should follow in this classroom every single day, whether it has to do with putting your uniform on, um, you know, horse play, student absence, you know, all those things. And then maybe even developing how many points are taken on. You know, classmates a point-based system. So how many points are taken off if you do use profanity, if you are late, if you are um, you know, not in uniform. So, you know, because all these things collectively, when they happen in your classroom, whether it happens with one or two students, affects the rest of the class. And they see that. You know, in our school, we have a lot of um, prizes for classes who have perfect attendance. We have prizes for classes who, you know, um, you know have the least amount of accidents in their classroom per year, whatever. You know, it can be anything like that. And some students actually get very angry because other students are absent all the time and they that stops that class from getting a prize or they don't participate in you know the reading program so then they never get prizes that go t towards the reading program so these kinds of things uh, you know when you give incentives like this it's it's really good although there could be one or two students that you know in that class that end up bringing the rest of the class down and this is where the development of rules 
by students can help that situation. You know, they get their word out. They, you know, they say, you know, we, we're tired of people being absent all the time. Let's create some rules. Let's create, you know, another, maybe a, another incentive, you know, where, um, you know, the teacher would have an incentive in and of themselves for, you know, creating a, a you know, students coming to school more often or whatever. So, you know, in, this is done in a couple different classrooms. The students would develop the rules. They would uh, do it in group atmosphere. And then all together, they would come up with a master set of rules. And they would create a poster with those rules. And it would be posted in the room, all created by the students. They can have it laminated. And it can be used that year. And um, you know, it gives them that sense of accountability that this is my classroom. This is the rules that we do. You know, this is the rules we follow. The same can be done of safety posters, have students assign different pieces of equipment where they actually uh, create their own poster that helps the students remember the safety rules for that piece of equipment. It can be laminated again and posted uh, right by that piece of equipment or whatever. So when you use this piece of equipment, look at that safety poster, make sure you have all these things in place before you turn it on or whatever. So, um, you know, that's another way of getting students' input and giving students some responsibility in the classroom. This is um, a sample question from the VAK. And uh, it says, if I'm teaching someone something new, I tend to, do I write down instructions? Do I give them a verbal explanation? Do I demonstrate? Then let them try and do it. And depending on how a student answers these questions that are on this test, it determines whether they're visual, auditory, or kinesthetic. And on the bottom there, I have the link that we use at our school for this. You can do a paper and pencil one, although it's cumbersome to grade um, or you know to assess the student. We did you know before we had this website, before there was anything you know of this nature, we did it. With pen and pencil on it. It was a little bit time consuming. So if you can, I would say do it on the computer. There's also a site um, called allkindsofminds.org. And uh, it has an extensive um, you know, assessment for students to find their um, learning style. It's very long, uh, although enjoyable. It has great graphics and it's a lot of fun. It does. It is a little time consuming. It really gives students some tremendous feedback. So if they are a visual, you know, learner and you know they want to try to incorporate more auditory skills, it kind of gives them suggestions on how to do that. It gives them suggestions about you know how to you know create a more well-rounded kind of way of learning. So it, it's very informative and and fun. Uh, it probably isn't something that you'll want to do maybe in your classroom unless you have a, a tremendous amount of downtime because it does take a while for each student to do it and uh, it's extensive. So it could be something the students could do on their own at home if they so choose to. This is an example of a Wordle and uh, these can, there's all different sites that have different you know, ways of doing this. This is a, you know, Wordle, I think Wordle.com. If you Google Wordle, you'll find it. But basically what it is is it's just a um, you know, program that you type in the words and it creates these um, Wordles. It's a, you know, a, a list of words that can be part of a uh, chapter or a unit in your curriculum or your, whatever you're covering for that particular day or week. These can be made by the students or you. Uh, I prefer to have the students make them. They can be also used as a, an attention getter. So you could put this up you know, on your uh, projection screen in the morning, and it would give the students an idea of what was to come for that day for that theory lesson. So in this case, it was about electrical safety. And uh, the way the words are formed is, the more you type in a word, the larger it will become in your Wordle. So the word electrical is very big, and because I typed it in about four times. And then safety is a little big, is a little smaller, and outlet is a little smaller. I might have put those in twice. And then ground, MSDS technology, they might have only been put in once. So you know, it just depends on how the student types the words in. And it will generate this. And you can keep clicking over and over and over again. And it will put it in different fonts, different backgrounds, different colors all kinds of things. So you can make them as you know creative as you want. And they can be saved to be accessed for later. Or I took a snippet and just created it 
that way, and I just file and save them as snippets. So that can be done uh, as part of vocab review that the students actually do this, or you know, and as a lead into a theory lesson. Should we stop here for a second? Well, we can. Um, what let's we we do just have about two or three minutes. Okay. Uh, for Tracy, so please, this is a good time to type your questions in or your comments or things you'd like to share so that when Tracy wraps up in about three minutes, um, we can go ahead and address your comments and questions. Thanks, Tracy. Do you want me to keep going? Yeah, go ahead and finish, finish up. Okay. Thank you. All right, so positive relationships uh, is the last area I'm going to cover. Um, actually, this is one of the most important parts of you know, classroom management is having a positive relationship with your students, showing a genuine interest in your students, caring about your students' success. Having them know this and realize this goes a long way towards great classroom management, great uh, you know, the reduction in um, you know, discipline issues. Uh, you know, students need positive role models. Uh, students need relationships. And sometimes you may be the only adult, you know, that is there for them if they need something. You know, they may, because we see them for hours, you know, per day, more than any other teacher, uh, you know, you're going to develop a relationship that's stronger than, you know, some of their other teachers back at their home schools or, you know, in their academic world. So, um, you know, this is important to, you know, learn about your students, um, you know, and develop the relationship with the parents as well. This is, you know, of utmost importance. Not only when they do something that needs a discipline referral or is something that maybe is uh, a concern of yours, but also when they do a good job. Think about those student mentors and how you can call a parent and say, I just want to tell you that, you know, your student has been, you know, a, a terrific role model for other students. They've, you know, shown caring and they've helped other students and you know, parents love to hear those things. So call them and tell them those things. Teamwork and doing team building activities with your with your students. Uh, it, these are great ways of developing relationships with your students, with them, with each other. But sometimes they don't have the greatest relationship with each other, and they need to understand that they've got to work with people sometimes that they don't particularly care for, that they've got to tolerate some things sometimes, and developing those leadership positions and, you know, responsibilities as, you know, part of their, you know, program area is very, very important and doing team building activities helps. Um, you know, you can Google team building activities, you'll find tons of things. Um, giving them those, those um, roles within their teams as well is, is very helpful too. Getting to know you activities, we do these at the beginning of the school year, this doesn't mean they can't be done later. You know, doing personality profile things. I have a few examples. If um, anybody wants to email me, there's one where the students actually draw a pig, and depending on how they draw the pig, it tells about their personality. It's fun. You know, it's certainly not you know scientific. You know, maybe based, but it sure is fun, and it gets the ball rolling and gets students to understand how they you know how they relate to other people, what their personality is like. Doing life maps, how they see themselves 20 years from now. Um, all about me boards, which I have some examples of that can be done on PowerPoint. It can be done, you know, on a you know a pin board. It can be done um, old-fashioned, cutting out a magazine page and pasting it on paper. Some students still really like doing those kinds of things. And then having weekend summaries. A lot of our instructors do a Monday kind of huddle or wrap up or a fireside chat where they talk to their students about what they did over the weekend. And, uh, you know, what did you do? Oh, well, why? You know, oh, I didn't know you were into doing things like that. I didn't know that you participated in that or whatever. And, you know, it's kind of a neat way to, you know, again, develop that relationship. This is a, uh, an example of, of a profile board that was done in PowerPoint. Um, the students' pictures are taken, and they create their own um, board. And sometimes the teachers just have them do a free for all, you know, put out, put down whatever you want somebody to know about you. Other other teachers have, you know, a set of criteria. I want I want to know what your favorite food is. I want to know, you know, uh, some some of you know some of what you're thinking about doing after you graduate. You know, so he says after he completes his course here at RMCTC, he's going to go to UTI. 
He's looking forward to how to learn, a, a, you know, CNC, you know, those kinds of things. And the teacher who does this in particular, he posts them, and this is the machine shop teacher, he posts them on a bulletin board when, the, when you walk into his classroom, they're all right there. And actually, as his students complete their NIM certification, he takes those little, he actually has printouts of each little certification that they've received, and they're, they're pinned and um, taped or stapled to that student's uh, profile so that anybody coming in can see how many of those NIMs, you know, um, they've completed. So that's a kind of a neat way for you know students to get recognition for the work they've completed, and it also creates a little bit of competition within the classroom. You know, hey, I got three or four NIMs, you know, completed or whatever, and you know, let's go, you know, pick up the pace. You know, they kind of give each other some feedback and, and encouragement. This happens Tracy, to be another one. I'm going to ask you um, to just wrap up if you can. And then we'll we'll need to honor the time here, so we'll finish up. So, um, if you don't mind, just giving us your parting parting words. Right. Okay. And this is a book that you can email me about if you're interested in anything that I talked to you about. It has a lot of the things in there that I talked about today. Um, and we all know the multiple roles we um, you know, the multiple hats we wear as a as a teacher. And there they are, and it's a short list. I'm sure everybody has more than just that. But um, that's why we're here and why we do the things that we do. So there's my contact information at the end of the PowerPoint. Tracy, thank you so much. Uh, we've had some nice comments and feedback. And we really thank you for sharing your expertise and, and uh, those reminders of things we can do to build routine and rapport with students. Um, James Jesperger, uh, said that you know it's so true especially in an inner city school making those um, personal connections how important that is and that uh, there are no questions so I'm going to keep going to wrap up here but that brings me James to a quote that I'd like to share but to do that I need to switch screens and I'm so afraid I'm going to cut you off so just let me let me not multitask I'm going to quickly do this Okay, so now you should be able to see my screen. I did it, and everyone's still there. So glad. Um, okay, yeah, we're laughing now. We weren't laughing yesterday or the other day. Um, so thank you so much. I would like to share this quote with you. It's something I've uh, shared with parents and, and community over the time. Um, oh, sorry, first let me just share this. You will be receiving an email, a self-assessment uh, it's just a tool for you to go through and see how you would rate, rate yourself in these areas of um, classroom management, routines, procedures. It's pulled right from the Charlotte Danielson from the new teacher effectiveness tool in the state of Pennsylvania, so you can kind of do double duty and see how you're doing on some of the aspects of that. There is no need to return it. We're not going to be grading it. It's for you to do self-reflection on your, on your own. Please do. Uh, register for the next webinar. Um, your next webinar for the electrical group is on Tuesday, January 7th, and the information for that will also be in the email that I'm going to send out. And now, if you don't mind indulging me, I'm going to read one of my favorite educational quotes, uh, both as a teacher and as a parent of school-age kids. This really resonates with me. I've come to a frightening conclusion. I am the decisive element in the classroom. It's my personal approach that creates the climate. It's my daily mood that makes the weather. As a teacher, I possess a tremendous power to make a child's life miserable or joyous. I can be a tool of torture or an instrument of inspiration. I can humiliate or heal. In all situations, it is my response that decides whether a crisis will be escalated or de-escalated, and a child humanized or dehumanized. I just, I really love that. And as I said, as par if you if you are a parent, you know that your own child, um, if if he or she has a ch a teacher who is 
humiliating or dehumanizing, it really can affect the whole family when a child's upset by that. So um, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, our information for Jennifer and I is on the screen at this time. You'll also receive an email from us. I think I need to mute someone. I'm getting a lot of feedback. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and mute. I think, Tracy, I'm going to go ahead and mute you. Sorry about that. I think we were picking up on your speaker. Um, I would like to say that um, the next, the next uh, webinar is going to be focusing on technical reading and technical writing. We'll be ta it's called But I'm Not a Reading Specialist, and we'll be talking about um, how you might incorporate areas of literacy that are true to your profession, not inauthentic uh, tasks just for the sake of doing them. We do have, um, oh, thanks, Dave. I thought it was a question, but Dave said thank you, and thank you for your attentiveness and for participating. Is there anything else before we wrap up today and go back to our real lives? All right. Well, it's a, at least in my part of Pennsylvania, it's a sunny day, but it's cold. I hope everyone else has seen some sun and keeping warm. Thank you so much. Jennifer, is there anything else? Just a reminder that we'll be also sending out your yearbook, which is your directory of, of your colleagues on the PLC. And if you haven't yet submitted information from that, for that, rather, you can send that to us, and we'll be doing an update in, in a month or so. And please do that. Uh, we love to read about you, so when we get comments and questions from you, we can kind of put a, a face to the name. And I, I personally like reading the hobbies. It's very interesting to me. We have a lot of fishermen in our PLCs. Okay, thank you so much. We will not be talking to you possibly until after the holidays. So everyone have a safe and sane holiday. And Tracy, thank you again. Take care, everyone. This concludes our webinar today. Bye-bye.